So my name is Ewan and I have been working at the University of Edinburgh as the Wikimedian in Residence since January 2016, so over eight years now. Uh, and this talk is called Student Engagement with Openness. So I've included a 15 minute video of interviews with staff and students at the University of Edinburgh over the years that you can watch at your leisure after this, because I'm not gonna show you a video clip, it's no, there's no use. Uh, so, but we also have a real life student right here. <laughs> so Ruby uh, is pictured on the right here. And she'll tell you about her experience working with Wikipedia and Wikidata on our Map of Witches project a little later in the talk. Uh, and we also have the Edinburgh University students there and the 1838 Snowball Riot, uh, which is now an article on Wikipedia that we have on our linked on our University of Edinburgh page. So uh, for those that don't know our story, our background, Edinburgh is one of the UK's ancient universities founded in 1583. So the question about eight years ago, would it engage with Wikipedia? Like only founded in 2001, but already one of the largest reference works on the internet. Well, maybe not in 2001, but maybe now. Uh, well, yes, so the university is a knowledge generating and research led institution, and it, but it, and it has all these key commitments, institution commitments not just to supporting information literacy and information retrieval and synthesis, but open knowledge, digital skills, supporting equality, diversity, and inclusion. So hiring and hosting a Wikimedian makes total sense to them. For them, it's a multiple return on investment. And it, I'm based in Information Services, which is a central support service that supports our three teaching colleges. And so I'm positioned at the heart of the university. And that's why I like to think that we are. Uh, but we, we see Wikimedia as partners. We are partners. We have these shared visions to imagine a world where everyone can freely share in the sum of all knowledge, but we want our graduates to discover the world and make the world a better place and make sure that our teaching and research is relevant to society and that uh, all, all that we are in teaching and research is diverse, inclusive, and accessible to all. And it started with students. Our student association challenged our senior managers way back in 2014 to make the learning resources open, not just for them, but for all of Scotland and the wider open knowledge community globally. So senior managers listened and our open education policy was approved in 2016 and two staff employed to promote and support that policy across the whole university. And then an extra member of staff was hired initially as an experiment, a one year part-time experiment, to help embed open practice, the Wikimedian in residence. And we have a booklet that you can download about five years of open education resources work at the University of Edinburgh. But as our assistant principal says, if you put your Wikimedian alongside your digital skills trainers, and learning technologists, their impact can be significant. Uh, this talks about students, but we work with staff as well. We work with staff collegiately as partners, and I deliver digital skills training workshops, design resources, design in curriculum assignments, deliver those as a sort of guest lecturer coming onto the courses, and give advice uh, across the whole university about creating and improving pages related to course disciplines, but also give the university advice about avoiding uh, disruptive editing behavior like conflict of interest and academic boosterism about the university itself, about its academic research, and about the staff themselves. They recognize their presence uh, needs to be sort of, uh, that Wikipedia is often the, where the people will find out most about them as an initial port, first port of call. And they want to engage in the right way. Um, but we also have another booklet that was first launched in April 2020, and people missed it because it was during COVID. 
Uh, but we've now updated this with a, a new digital edition that you can download from our session page that has net seven new case studies, taking us up to 21 case studies of how UK educators are working with Wikipedia in the curriculum in secondary school, further education, and higher education. Uh, but like I say, this talks about students. And I'm pleased to say that we've, we've managed to engage the university to such an extent that I've ha been able to hire a student to be my assistant Wikimedian. And Ellie's uh, working back in Edinburgh while we're here in Poland. Um, but she's also a MSCR history research student working on a dissertation at the same time. But she's helping me do more community building, more outreach, because it's a big university but also reviewing our website and the resources to make sure they are up to, up to date and as good as possible, and also helping me deliver, plan, promote, and do more Women in Red workshops in partnership with different course disciplines and different student groups. An example of her work was, her first edit-a-thon was a Robert Burns night edit-a-thon on the 25th of January, where we focused on Scottish women writers, poems, poets, and songs, and a page about Robert Burns' skull, because we have Robert Burns' skull at the University of Edinburgh, or a cast. So you can read about that page on Wikipedia, although someone's handily deleted the picture. So don't get me started on OTRS. OK, she's also done her work, uh, worked with legal students and our Global Justice Academy for International Women's Day. Uh, to write about women working in global justice around the world. And our most recent event was at our Musical Instrument Museum for World Music Day in June on unknown women composers, where we created pages about women composers and women instrument makers and collaborated with BBC Radio 3 producer Luke Whitlock, who is doing a course digging into the music archives to find these hidden women composers. Uh, our upcoming events are, there's going to be one about uh, Scottish heritage, castles, witch and ghost law for Wiki Loves Monuments in September, and then ce celebrating our annual Women in STEM celebration for Ada Lovelace Day in October, and one in nursing, but we haven't got a date for that one yet. Uh, in terms of in-curriculum work, our longest running course started back in 2015, uh, where we work with reproductive biology students. Um, where 80 to 90% of the class cohort are women. And the students have always become really hugely enthused and excited and proud of their achievements in improving pages about reproductive terms not well represented on Wikipedia. And the, the course leaders are enormously pleased as well that the students are learning how to evaluate digital resources and knowledge bases and how best to use them, but also how to communicate to a lay audience which for a medical student is a skill that they really need and don't get an often enough opportunity to exercise during their course program. Uh, here's one of the students that we worked back with in 2016-2017, Anya Kavanagh, and she wrote an article on one of the most deadly and most common forms of ovarian cancer that wasn't represented at all on Wikipedia. And we interviewed her back in 2017 and she talks about how motivating it was for her and her other students to use knowledge from their lectures and, ex and exams, which for them hadn't been really relevant. It hadn't felt relevant until she was able to put it to some real world public good like this. And what's especially lovely is that we followed up with her after she graduated and she came back in because she was still enthusiastic about that project work. And she sat down at a podcast with us to talk about Wikipedia women in STEM, and general science communication and how Rick, Wikipedia's role in that. And you can, read a, you can listen to her podcast at that short link. Uh, other in-curriculum work has included translation studies that's been going for seven years, uh, where they translate 2,500 words from an article of their choice, from a high quality featured or good article, and then giving them a, cho a chance to get meaningful published practice before the world of work. And they've said, the opportunity to translate something practical that will end up being read by people, just that motivation itself was the biggest positive. So we're talking articles like 
Isle of Skye from English to Chinese, or the origins of the Sami people from Swedish to English, or anything that they are particularly interested in so they can personalize their learning. Uh, more recent courses that have come online uh, in the last two or three years, we've worked with history of art students where they learn how to edit and evaluate pages related to Islamic art and science, and then motivated to improve those pages with their research. But it's not just writing, they illustrate pages with Creative Commons licensed images from the Khalili collections that Dr. Martin Poulter has been sharing to Wikimedia Commons, so that people can encounter non-Western art. Uh, adding beautiful images of Islamic art, jewelry, and earthenware, so they appear on general pages. So they're much easily, more easily discoverable. So you can read about inkwells and see a 10th century beautiful inkwell covered in Kufic script. And as the course leader says, applying our knowledge outside the classroom gave us a sense that we were creating something positive, something that mattered. As one of our students commented, really love the Wikipedia project. It feels like my knowledge is actually making a difference in the wider world, if in a small way. And there's a picture of the, the aforementioned Inkwell. Anyway, global health challenges. We work in person, but also with purely online courses. And this is a course where students often work all over the world and they are collaborating online, and they say there's no opportunity for meaningful group work. So they loved the Wikipedia project because they were able to collaboratively use their research to evaluate and improve short stub articles on natural and man-made disasters around the world by 1,500 words. And one student said, I think this was my favorite assignment to date and of, in the degree, and while the contents of the article were relatively high level, I thoroughly enjoyed working with my fellow classmates. Uh, but it's not just in the curriculum. We've also uh, pioneered a new digital volunteering with Wikipedia Edinburgh Award to recognize students' work outside of their studies. And this is where this award record accredits students for volunteering extracurricular hours, 55 to 80 hours from October to March, where they choose a topic area for research on Wikipedia, and these are some of their ideas in a word cloud, some of the most vital and important and underrepresented marginalized topics on Wikipedia, and then they improve it by sometimes as much as 10 to 12,000 words by the end of March. And some of these topics are listed here, but it also supports evidencing that they have learned digital research skills, improved their communication skills, and it supports their graduate employability as well in an increasingly competitive market. So they come to this end of award uh, celebration where the senior managers come and thank them for their efforts. They get a certificate, a glass of wine, and, a, and an entry on their official higher education achievers report that complements their degree. Uh, we also have extracurricular projects like the Scotland Slavery and Black History Project, where a history professor did a call to arms that Wikipedia's content about Scotland's involvement in the transatlantic slave trade needed much improvement. So we did a four-week project from November to Jan uh, in, during COVID, so it was online, and history societies improved by doing paired writing to improve those pages, and it culminated a student panel presentation because they, were, they thought it was a great project and they thought it was a great example of best practice, and they, want, and they actually recorded videos to support secondary schools that wanted to do more work in this area as well. Uh, and this then begat an extra project where some of the same students co-authored a proposal with me for a student experience grant which was a funded project where, where three students worked one day a week for 14 weeks to research important histories relating to gender, history, black history, and LGB history missing from Wikipedia. So their research culminated an end-of-project editing event, which was delivered in person and online so students from across the UK and staff from across the UK could contribute and continue this work and be inspired to continue this work as well. And finally, we offer employment opportunities to students as well, internships at information services, either one day a week during term time or 12 weeks during the summer. 
And Hannah spent lockdown 2020 creating a new 40-page website to explain simply how to edit Wikipedia. And 20 short how-to video tutorials, open licensed on YouTube that anyone can use so that they can teach Wikipedia at our institution or any other, online, hybrid, or in person. And for this, she won an Open Education Global Award. And I'm now going to hand over to uh, Ruby to sort of re go through our, an example of our further work with interns. Okay, here we go. Hi, I'm Ruby. Sorry, can I get the new slides up? Or, um... Thank you. So. Hi, my name's Ruby, and I started working on the Map of Accused Witches in Scotland project last summer as an intern at the university. I did it for three months last summer and then continued to do it one day a week while I continued on with my computer science degree at university, and I'm doing it for another three months this summer. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about the history of the project. So the origins of the project go back to the early 2000s when a group of historians at the university created the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft. So for those that don't know, during the thick, between the 16th to 18th century, um, there was loads of prosecutions of both men and women prosecuted for witchcraft that le led to imprisonment and um, executions. So what they did was collected all the information they could find and created the Survey of Scottish Witchcraft, which is a database containing information on over 3,000 um, accused witches. So this can be accessed online here through this link or through a Microsoft Office database. And it's a very valuable resource used by loads of historians and researchers. researchers. But it is quite a complicated resource to navigate, so it's not the most accessible to all users. So what we did was to try to think about different ways that this information could be presented. So this began in 2017 when you supported data, data science for design master's students and uploading the data to Wikidata so that they could create engage engaging visualizations with the data. So here is an image of a laser cut um, interactive map of accused witches. But there was still so much more that could be left um, to do with the data. So this sparked the idea for this interactive website. So this is the map of accused witches in Scotland, which you can find by scanning the QR code or following the link here. Um, so it's an online map that you can zoom into and explore, and by clicking on the icons, you can find out information with an ind about an individual witch, including information such as their name, the year of their case, their residence, and occupation, and social class, and many more information on the other pages about their cases. Um, so I'll tell you about who worked on the project. It began in 2019 when Emma Carroll, a geography student at the university, um, worked on geolocating the data. So there's lots of locations in the database, for example, residences, um, location of executions and detentions. Um, but lots of the place names have changed since the time of the trials. Um, so they're not the same names anymore. So it wasn't just a simple concept of like looking up in Google Maps, getting the coordinate and adding this to um, Wikidata. She had to speak to experts, look through historical maps and um, gazettes and things like that to try to find this information before uploading it to Wikidata. Then through that, sh you could write a query and you're able to create the website. So the website was then launched after her work in October 2019. But there's been many more interns working on the project since. For example, Maggie Lynn, who added even more data about the cases up um, to Wikidata and created some more visualization. And then Claire Panela in May 2023, um, she created a data quality framework for checking the data so that we were able to compare what was in Wikidata to the original survey. And I'll tell you more about that later. Um, and then so all these interns were supported by um, the software developer Richard Lawson at the university. Um, and none of this would be possible without him as he really was a great help in developing the website. And then there was also open source web developer intern um, Joseph who... Um, helped update the software of the website, added the new visualizations that Maggie had created, and refactored some of the code. And then also, you already mentioned Assistant Wikimedian in Residence, Ellie. And what she's done, she's written quite a lot of content for us to add to the website, because um, 
not everything is obvious to users that don't already know about a lot about Scottish witch trials. So she's added some descriptions and introductions that we can add to the website, as this is part of the what she covers in her degree at the university. Um, so what I've done in the project is followed on from Claire's work and done some data quality assurance. So what this is, is I've been using the RStudio framework that she created and we read in the data from Wikidata and from the original database survey and see where the differences are. Some of this is mistakes during the uploads um, or changes that have been made since. And they're both positive and negative. Some of them are edits made by other knowledgeable users that are very positive and have helped us add even more information um, and update on the, what was in the survey. But also some were mistakes, so we've, what I've been doing when there's been anomalies, I've been doing some research myself and also contacting the historian at the University profession, Professor Julian Goodard, and he has been helping to find out what is the most accurate information, and that means that what's shown on our website is um, as accurate as we can get it. I also was fixing bugs on the website, um, as lots of new visualisations have been added, um, there, this, increased, this added some bugs. So I've been solving them and also did some usability testing on version 2 of the website. So we, did, we got eight different users. Four of them were already experts on, or very interested at least, in the Scottish Witch Trials. But also we did it with four users who had no previous knowledge. And this helped us um, get ideas for new things to add to the website, what they'd be interested in, and also assess kind of how accessible the website is. And then we've also been adding in some new features. And hopefully, in October, version 2 will be launched. Um, so here are some new features are in the website. Um, there's a new interface, hopefully making it more usable. Um, a timeline selector, so you can see how the hysteria spread through um, the years of the Scottish Witch Trials. Um, Histopedia timeline, which gives even more information about the individual accused witches. And again, you can see it as through time. There's some new filters. So this is, um, there's new case information. For example, the women, the women and men who were accused were accused of having packs with the devil, meeting and um, meeting with other witches, packs with, yeah. So that's what some of the new filters are about. There's a historic map a contact form to get feedback, and there's some new visualisations. We've also got a map of memorials. Because this was such a big mis like injustice to so many people that were accused, and there's now lots of memorials dedicated to them. Um, so this is, means that people can go and visit them when they're in Scotland. And we also have a glossary to, to help people understand the terms that are used in the website. And there's many more as well. So. Um, this project has had lots of impact. So far, six student interns have worked on this project. And from that, we've all learned loads of new skills with Wikidata and web development. And there's also data science students um, involved who got, all got to create really exciting projects from this as well. And like, it's brought so many exciting opportunities, for example, me being able to be here. It launched in September 2019. And by January 2020, it already had 120,000 users from 113 countries. And that really shows the impact that these Wikidata projects can have and how far student work can go. It got media attention from news outlets such as BBC, The New York Times, STV News. And it was really exciting to see that. And then we also get lots of feedback from people that use the website. For example, PhD researchers, local history and community groups and um, schools that are using it. And then also through edit-a-thons and um, we have now got 50 pages on Scottish accused witches helping to tell the individual story of the people that were prosecuted. Thank you. Here's the QR code again um, for anyone that wants to visit the witches site and also the update will be happening in October. So that's when the new features. So keep an eye out for them as well. Thank you very much. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Do you have any questions in person? Not see. Okay, I'm seeing at least two. So I'm going to just go in order, so you will be you will take. Hi. Uh, thank you for this uh, lovely uh, presentation, and also thank you for all the work you do and all the knowledge uh, you share. I make a regular uh, use of it. I'm uh, Michelle. I work at Wikimedia Netherlands. 
And we um, don't have a really dedicated education program at the moment, but we do work um, with students uh, occasionally with universities. And one of the um, uh, things we encounter is that uh, when they write articles, they get um, stuck in their sandbox and not published. And I was wondering if you have experience with that and if you um, would have some advice how to go about that. I make them publish. Like I, 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 I force them to. Like uh, not not in an unkind way, but it's it's. We if we're running a session, I, I might sort of do training one week, but the research and editing might take come back the, the uh, an hour the next week or whatever. But I I do sort of say, look, if you look at Thrawn, there's an article about Robert Louis Stevenson's uh, short story called Thrawn Janet. That starts as 50 words, like title in bold, citations, full stop, references. And I say, if you can get that, we can publish. And I want you to have that feeling. You can always edit after that and improve it, but we're going to need to publish. So publish your parish culture is still very much alive or well and well. OK, I think I've got one fan. As well. I was just sorry, I'm going to partially answer. Hello, I'm Sarah from Wikimedia UK. Hello again. Um, I'm just going to add that Ewan does another thing. He's underselling himself here. Um, he also builds into his sessions and um, very clearly sets the expectations at the beginning um, that there is 10 to 15 minutes at the end of a training session in which we shall publish and goes around and then shares that page and everybody gets a really lovely feeling of being able to celebrate the publication of that page. So things are, you set the expectation from the beginning. Oh. Sorry to jump you know, in on no, your question cool. there. But also, in, in some sessions, it's really nice if they're doing group editing to get them to come up and say, here's what we did, here's what it looked like before, here's what it looks like now. And that's, that gives them that sort of bake-off, sort of like there's a bit of, you know, a scurry at the end, but they're like really proud of their achievement at the end as well. Oh, hi. Um, I think what you're doing is really awesome. And I was just wondering if you had any uh, specific advice for expanding Wikimedia in residence programs. Like if you were to tell other people uh, about what you do, uh, what would you uh, suggest that they do? <laughs> like your advice. I mean, I, I have high level support from a principal, assistant principal, our, our head of IT. And that makes a big difference. She's able to have those conversations at a high level. But ultimately she says, if, if your institution can't afford, say they can't afford to host a, a Wikimedia, we say you can't afford not to. We are, part, we are part of the knowledge ecosystem. Students and staff are using it. We need to be instructing them how to do best practice. And we, we evangelize about it at conferences like this. And I try and involve my boss as much as possible because she has that extra clout. But we try and surface all our findings, all our resources. And ultimately, it's, it's up to other organizations. But we, 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 advocacy, as Sarah will tell you, has a long tail. But you get there in the end. But it takes those conversations and engaging in those conversations and getting the people in the room. And how you get them in the room in the first place might be going to those presentations, those conferences, and then taking it from there. OK, I think we have actually run out of time. Sorry. Uh, any further questions you can ask them in the hallway. You can ask them in the hallway for any further questions. Yeah, uh, our contact details are on the, the session notes and just come and speak to us. We're very happy to, to share whatever you need, basically. Okay, thanks. And with that said, for now. Maybe you want to do a mic drop.